So today we're going to be talking a little bit more about Spinoza and Leibniz, uh, who you're moving into this week, the last of the rationalist philosophers that we are reading for this term, and also be beginning John Locke this week. That's coming up. So now, in Descartes, you recall how Descartes makes this very sharp distinction between mind and body, two fundamentally different substances. Body is this extended stuff, this material, inert, extended stuff that doesn't think or have any kind of consciousness. Mind, on the other hand, is immaterial, thinking stuff with no extension whatsoever. And uh, we saw that Descartes' reason, one of his prime motivations in trying to draw such a sharp distinction between mind and body, is in order to be able to give a fully deterministic interpretation of the physical world. Everything in nature happens because it has to happen as it does. Everything is determined by antecedent causes in nature. Whereas mind, on the other hand, is free. The human mind is free. There's nothing to constrain us, our choices at all. We are utterly free in our choices. We might uh, be constrained by uh, other sorts of limitations of power or physical limitations, but in terms of what we can think and will, there is nothing to uh, determine that we have to think one thing or do one thing rather than another thing. So let's take a look at what Spinoza does with this. So, uh, you probably saw, it's probably fairly evident, that Spinoza denies the existence of such a thing as free will altogether. Indeed, he gives a very deterministic account of nature, and this is much in agreement with Descartes. Everything in nature is fully determined, and it happens because it has to happen the way it does. Everything is necessary. Everything in nature, physical nature, happens in accordance with the laws of physics. There is no freedom in nature. But nature, for Spinoza, is all that there is. Nature is identical to God, and there is nothing outside of nature. So while he gives this uh, deterministic interpretation of nature that sounds much like Descartes' interpretation, Spinoza denies the existence of free will altogether. Indeed, Spinoza says that the very idea of free will is a self-contradictory notion. Uh, a will, what is a will? Well, a will is a determination to, or a desire that something comes into existence or that something be done or acted upon in one way rather than another way. And when we will something, we have reasons for our choices. There are things that motivate us things that determine the will in one direction rather than in another direction. It is not something that happens just totally random and spontaneous. So Spinoza argues that this very notion of a free will is almost a contradiction in terms. If it's a will, it can't possibly be free, not in the sense that Descartes is talking about at any rate. This applies to God, too, for Spinoza. God could not have done anything other than God actually does. Uh, nature unfolds from moment to moment, totally in accordance with the nature of God. Nothing could possibly be different than it actually is. Now, in Descartes, we notice that there's maybe a small element of this, too. Right? Descartes would certainly assert, for example, that God could not possibly bend the laws of, uh, uh, the laws of logic. God could not make a world in which uh, a contradiction could be true, could happen. Right? Uh, and so Spinoza, perhaps, thinking this in the same direction further, says, well, there isn't anything that God could do differently than what God actually does. Okay? To do something different would be contrary to the very nature of God. So God has no choices in this sense. That does not mean, however, that God is not free for Spinoza. And this is an important point because we see here that Spinoza 
uh, more explicitly perhaps than any philosopher before, uh, generates a new understanding of freedom, and um, uh, even though Spinoza denies it to human beings, a human freedom, than we have hitherto seen. Now, what is freedom after all? And why does it seem important to us to think of ourselves and consider ourselves as being free? This has fundamentally a moral importance for us. And remember Spinoza's title of his book is Ethics, and there's a, a, it's a very important component of that book. The idea of freedom has moral importance uh, to us because uh, we can't see any moral value in our actions if we have no responsibility for our actions. And how can we have responsibility for our actions if we don't have any choices in those actions? If everything is determined in accordance with the laws of nature, it might seem that we just do what we have to do. We couldn't have done things any differently. It's not really our choice. It's all the result of an external force. If you step outside the door and there happens to be a hurricane or a tornado blowing by and this wind blows and knocks you down to the ground, uh, that's not your choice. You aren't free to do anything differently. Uh, you can hardly be blamed. Nobody could find fault with you for not remaining standing under that force, because okay, so the force came upon you from without. Uh, so freedom is important to us for moral reasons. But what is freedom for Spinoza? Because Spinoza, even though Spinoza says that it would be impossible for God to do anything differently than God actually does, nature happens as it, as it has to happen, it's by necessity, Spinoza still asserts that God is in fact free. And what freedom means here is that God is autonomous. There is nothing that God does that is compelled from outside of God. So if we think about, uh, say, a stone or a rock, and Spinoza in one of the letters that he wrote to a correspondent uh, explicating his notion of um, freedom and his denial of freedom of the will asks us to imagine a rock that has been impacted with a force and set in motion. And Spinoza states that if we can imagine for a moment that this rock uh, had consciousness, if we could endow it with consciousness, it would see its motion as being an action that it's undertaking in accordance with its own desire, right? that it's doing what it wants to do. Now, but why does the rock move? Why does any rock move? Well, any rock is inert. It's going to sit in place unless a force is applied to it from outside of it. And that's what's going to cause it to move. If that is then not precisely not free. In the case of God, since God is everything after all, there's nothing outside of God that constrains God or that compels God to act in one way rather than in another way. All action is from God's own nature. God makes the law, you know, namos, right, by God from within God itself, autos, he has autonomy. And this is the true sense of freedom for Spinoza. Uh, now, think for a moment about how that is relevant to what we see as a theory of moral responsibility. If freedom means that anything at all could happen, that our actions are totally spontaneous, that it's not a choice that was determined by any kind of cause, which would have to include any kind of uh, rational motivation or reason to do something one way or another way. If freedom means that something happens because it, that's whatever happens is totally unpredictable, totally at random, well, that's a kind of freedom uh, that wouldn't have much value to us if we had it, if our actions were totally at random and unpredictable and totally uncaused in that sense. 
freedom in uh, a sense that gives us some real notion of moral responsibility is something that is uh, uh, where a choice is autonomous. It's not compelled. And we, we run into compulsion uh, and constraint all the time. We're often limited, either limited by uh, other people or limited by uh, physical forces or other things. So freedom for Spinoza means autonomy. And in, in this sense, God is free. Now, humans don't have free will. Indeed, humans and everything else in existence, individual things in this world and nature, are basically parts of God. So we are not free. However, this does not mean that there is not a sense of uh, liberty, which Spinoza opposes to bondage, that human beings are capable of. Human beings can exist in a state of bondage. And what is bondage? Bondage is a state of enslavement, okay? and it's a state of enslavement that we, in effect, can impose upon ourselves, or that we can exist under our own, the result of our own minds, our own thinking, precisely in those situations where our ideas are inadequate. Our ideas are not an accurate reflection of the nature of things and an understanding of the causes of those things and why they have to be the way they are rather than otherwise. So, how does Spinoza deal then with this problem of the relationship of mind and body? Descartes, the way Descartes defined mind and body as these two distinct substances, we were left with this difficulty of explaining how they can interact. How does mind have an impact on body as it does? How does body in a turn have an impact upon mind? Well, for Spinoza, we see that they are not uh, different substances at all. Indeed, there's only one substance, and that's God or nature. Mind and body are two attributes of that substance. The two attributes of that substance that we have some uh, knowledge and awareness of. Two out of the, in fact, infinite attributes that he says God has. And since they're two distinct attributes, they don't interact at all. It makes no sense to think about them as interacting. Suppose we have, for an analogy, suppose we have a physical object, let's say uh, an apple. Okay, well, it has a shape, it has a color, it has a smell, it has a taste. It has all different kinds of properties or attributes, what we could think of as attributes, if we're going to think of the apple as a substance. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us to ask then, well, how does the shape impact the color or the color impact the shape? My goodness, they go together. They're always together, the shape and the color. But how does one interact with the other one? Well, they don't interact. They're two distinct attributes, two different types of things that are part of the same thing. And so, too, he says, body and mind, these aren't substances, they're attributes. They're two distinct attributes. Since they're attributes of the same thing, of course they exist in parallel. So we can see a kind of correlation between mind and body. But there's no question of any kind of interaction going on between them. Now, when we get to Leibniz, keep all these things in mind that you've encountered in Spinoza, because although Leibniz has an extremely different theory, is a very different way of taking up all of these bits and pieces of Cartesian rationalism, the ones that Leibniz and many of the other rationalist philosophers in effect kind of accepted as presuppositions, and uh, a way in which Leibniz has of making sense out of those. So his theory is quite a bit different from Spinoza's, but I think that you will see certain reflections of the way that Spinoza deals with these issues of freedom, of mind and body and their relationship. And we can see that um, that's reflected to some extent in, in Leibniz as well, uh, despite the radically different and very, uh, what you will probably find is a very bizarre theory of the structure of reality. So until next time.